Good morning, everybody. It's good to see y'all. We're back in the book of Luke chapter 23. These are the last hours of Jesus before he goes to the cross. If you remember last week, we looked at Jesus, his betrayal, his arrest, his denial, and his trial. So we got to see all of those things compressed together in chapter 22. And of course, it begins with Judas and a contingency of guards which are armed and they have torches and they come to take him by force. We got to see Judas marking Jesus out by kissing him, which is not what a kiss is for and singling him out. And as they took him, Jesus made sure that the disciples didn't get taken along with him. And he says, well, if you're looking for me, well, then take me and let these go. And of course, Peter decides he's going to take things into his own hands. And that's always comforting. And so he pulls out a sword, which Jesus told him to carry, by the way. And he uses it in a way that Jesus never (laughs) intended to use it. And he goes over and he cuts off one of the high priest's servant's ears. His name's Malchus. And Jesus, stopping Peter from his rage, picks up the guy's ear, probably dusted it off, and puts it back on the man and heals him. One of the men that came to capture him and put him to death, he reaches down to put an ear on him, which is an amazing show of compassion in the face of adversity. We know that as everyone broke up, Peter follows at a distance and they take him to Annas, who's really the power behind the high priest. He was high priest at one point and had to step down because Rome didn't like the way he was running things and they appointed Caiaphas. High priests are supposed to be high priests for life until your death, but Rome changed that. So they take him to Annas and Annas begins to question him about his ministry and his teaching and his followers and We see Peter at a distance and we see Jesus getting struck because they believed that he was answering in an unkind way towards the high priest. And this was all wrong. The entire trial, uh, this religious inquisition was completely wrong. And so Peter then follows and they go to Caiaphas, who is the high priest. And it just so happens that the Sanhedrin are gathered. 70 men in one place. Can you imagine how hard that is to do? And this is in the middle of the night, just before morning. And they're all gathered and ready to hear. And Caiaphas begins to drill Jesus. And Peter is able to get inside the courtyard where Jesus is, along with John. John is related to somebody inside, and he tells the doorman, you can, you can let him in, and Peter's allowed in. And somebody recognizes him, a young maiden, says, weren't you with him in the garden? And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know the guy. And he gets recognized the second time. And they said, wait a minute. I, I think I saw you there. You were in the garden. And there's now a crowd beginning to develop around Peter, and Peter denies a second time that he even knows Jesus. And then there's a third time, it's about an hour later, someone else sees, sees him and says, certainly you were with him because you're a Galilean. And we know from the other passages that he calls down curses on himself. Like, may God send my soul eternally to hell if I know him in the strongest possible way. And then the rooster crows actually for a second time. And Peter is then embarrassed and it says that Jesus saw him at that point. And it says that Peter ran out of the courtyard and he wept bitterly. Following Jesus from a distance is never a good thing. (laughs) And disowning him completely is what Jesus said he would do when he boasted and said, I will never forsake you, Lord. I am ready to go to prison and die with you. And here's the the proud Peter who thought for sure that, that he'd be the the guy with the sword ready to defend Jesus against an entire army. And he's denying before a couple of simple folk at a fire. It's not the last time we hear about Peter beside a coal fire. We see it in John chapter 21 when he reinstates him into ministry after his resurrection. 
That smell has a way of bringing back memories. And so this week, we're looking at Jesus meeting Pilate and Herod and Barabbas, three characters that are going to see Jesus in a completely different light than maybe you and I do. And Pilate is the guy who's supposed to keep everything under control. He's the governor, and he's a Roman guard, and he's gotten there because he is a fierce, vicious, heartless man, and he shed lots of blood, and he doesn't care about the lives of human beings, and he doesn't care at all about Jews. He takes uh, these big symbols of Rome, and he puts them outside his uh, place where he's staying. And of course, the Jews believe that to be a graven image, and that was an assault on the Ten Commandments. And so he raises them up and makes lots of trouble. And so he's in trouble with Caesar because he's done some very uh, inconsiderate things to the Jews, which have caused them to riot, and nobody wants a riot on their hands. So we're going to take a good look at him. Beginning in verse 1. Then the whole multitude of them arose, and they led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, It is as you say. just reading this little section, you figure, oh, Jesus is cooked here. Pilate didn't give a rip about anything else except that last thing. So you're a king. Really? You appear to be bleeding and cuffed and incarcerated. And you're a king? He wants to know exactly what sort of a threat he is. The other things he just kind of fluffed off. And if you remember, when they were brought before Annas and Caiaphas, he wasn't accused of that at all. You remember what he was accused of? You call yourself the son of God. You make yourself equal with God. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying. And he was being prosecuted for blasphemy, claiming to be God. But you see, Pilate won't care about that. He's, a, he's not a religious ruler. He's not even a Jew. He doesn't care about that. So they've got to trump up some kind of charge that's got to stick to him. And so they're using such language that does. They tend to do this in courtrooms. Have you noticed? Pontius Pilate, he's a vicious man. And uh, there wasn't evidence until 1853 that he actually existed except for the scriptures. But that was enough for us, right? until they found actually a part of a stone that was broken off and it actually has his name on it, that he is the governor, and this is actually the stone. So until 1853, you say, ah, you can't rely on the Bible. These things are just stories. No, this is true. Oh, my bad, sorry. The same thing with so many things about the scriptures. There's more and more evidence that gets uncovered, and as we unearth through archaeology all these things, the Bible is proved every single time. This is Pontius Pilate. He previously, Jesus was previously uh, accused of blasphemy, stating his equality with God, his father. And that's what they charged him with. He's not able to enforce a death penalty, so they connive this way for the Romans to do their dirty work. You see, the Jews weren't allowed to assassinate anybody. The death penalty was off the table because they were using it kind of haphazardly. And the Jews were uh, making sloppy work of it. And so the Romans said, you're a subjugated people. You're not allowed to do that anymore. We reserve the right to execute people, not you. And they took it away from them. So they're definitely not in control. Now, Jesus is accused before this Roman court of three things, perverting the nation. That's a rather interesting, I imagine YouTube and Facebook and Twitter could be accused of the same. Perverting the nation to distort, oppose, plot against the saving purposes and plans of God. To turn aside from the right path or to corrupt. That's what the word means in the original language. And that's what they're accusing him of. But he's doing anything but that. He's pointing people to his heavenly father and saying they need to get off their own prideful horse. Number two, he forbids paying of taxes. If you remember, that was a direct question that was asked him. Should we pay taxes or not? And he asked them, well, 
do you have a denarii? And he said, oh yeah, I just so happened to. And by the way, for a Pharisee or for a religious ruler to have money in his pocket, as far as they were concerned, it was idolatry because there's a graven image in your pocket. But you see, they had a problem with paying taxes, but they had no problem buying into the system. And Jesus said, well, whose image is on that? I say, well, it's Caesar's. You're carrying around a picture of Caesar in your pocket. That, that could be seen as idolatry. And yet he says, give to Caesar what's Caesar, give to God what's God's. Very simple statement. And what is God's? Everything. 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 And especially since we're made in his image. Number three, proclaiming himself Christ, the king. That's something he is guilty of, isn't he? He proclaimed himself to be Christ, the savior, the king of heaven. The, the very son of God, the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus said, that's who I am. And that's really who he's being prosecuted as. The only thing that Pilate cares about is his kingship. Are you challenging the authority of Rome? It's interesting how this all works out because the Jews would only stone people to death for blasphemy. Jesus doesn't die by stoning. He dies by being hung on a cross. Before the Romans came, crucifixion existed, but it didn't exist like they had it. It was actually the Assyrians who invented it, and it was designed to punish somebody to the nth degree while they died slowly and drowning because essentially your lungs fill with fluid as you, all of your body weight is hanging on your wounds. It was a disgusting way to die. And yet the Romans even perfected it more. And it's so that the prophecies could be fulfilled. Psalm 22, verses 16 to 18, written by David, says this, For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has encircled me. They pierced my hands and my feet. This was written thousand years before crucifixion ever existed as a way to die. This is the prophecy of scripture. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me and they divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast locks. This was prophesied long before Jesus showed up. And it's word for word, everything that occurs at the cross, which tells me that's just one little insight into why the scripture can be relied upon because God wrote it through the penmanship of human beings. In John chapter 18, we're given a slightly different picture from John the apostle. It says, Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. In other words, we wouldn't have waken you up so early in the morning to bother you if he didn't really do something. And then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. So you see, they're showing what their motivation is. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. If you remember what Jesus said, he said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. You don't get lifted up when you get stoned. You got brought down. But you get lifted up on a cross. And that's what Jesus was signifying and certainly in Psalms about him being pierced. So Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no fault with this man. He just said he's a king. He just said, are you a king? He says, it is as you say. He just confessed to being a king. Pilate turns around to say, I don't see anything wrong with that. Pilate was not intimidated by a man who was cuffed and bleeding and beaten and thrown at his doorstep. And he knew that the jig was up. He knew because of pride that they had delivered Jesus over. I find no fault with them, but they were more fierce, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Oh no, he's teaching. <laughs> Don't teach. Apparently teachings against the law. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. Oh, how convenient. They're in Jerusalem for the feast. And Herod, who's a tetrarch, he's actually in charge of one quarter of this area. And that's what tetrarch means. He actually happens to be there. 
John 18 gives us a slightly different picture. And Pilate entered the praetorium again and he called Jesus and he said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, we're given the longer answer now. Are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you of this concerning me? It's interesting, he asked Pilate, are you wishing to be one of my followers? Or did somebody just give you this rumor? And Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? It's funny, I get flashes of my father when I hear that. What have you done? So Pilate's asking the flat out question to Jesus. He's being accused of all these things. And he says, what, what did you do? What have you done? And Jesus begins to tell him what he's done. And he says, I don't find any fault with this guy. He just said he's the king of heaven. You don't have a problem with that? He's not a man of faith, obviously. And he's not threatened by a man who says that he's from heaven. John 18, 33, 38, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Jesus is spilling the beans. Pilate therefore said to him, are you the king then? And Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And what does that say to Pilate? You don't hear because you don't hear the truth. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and he said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Jesus spills the beans and tells him his entire life's ministry and why he's here. And he says, I find nothing wrong with this guy. This is his enemy, the one who's ultimately going to send him to the cross, finds no fault with him. Innocent. John 8, 45, Jesus teaches us, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin, Jesus said. And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. You see, it's not the problem of understanding that people have. It's the understanding of its, its belief. You will never convince somebody's mind that Jesus Christ is who he said he's without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that will reveal something to somebody's heart. And unless, unless the Father first draws them to the Son, there's no hope of you convincing anyone of anything. And you might think, boy, that'd be a really good idea if I could get on a stage and be able to share my, my perspectives with people. I'm sure they would all listen. Well, they didn't listen to Jesus. What hope do you think you have? And Jesus understands this principle. Unless your heart is prepared, unless God draws you, unless he plows up the hard ground of our hearts, there's no way we're going to hear it. And so he says, oh, he's from Galilee. Cool. Not my jurisdiction. And now he's going to send him to Herod who's in charge of that section of Jerusalem. And Herod just so happens to be in the city this day. How convenient. He's avoiding responsibility. He's not resolving an issue. He's only making himself appear weak and cowardly. Here's a ruler who just wants to stay out of trouble. And he's avoiding making a decision. He says, listen, this guy's innocent. And they say, no, 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 no. You need to crucify him. We want him prosecuted. We, we have found him guilty. You need to punish him. But Pilate says, there's nothing wrong with this guy at all. Now you're in a, a political pickle. And so somebody says, oh, yeah, he's been teaching from Galilee all the way to here. Galilee? He's from Galilee? No problem. I got a guy who will handle that. I don't have to take responsibility for my decision. How many of you have trouble with procrastinating in such a way as this? Okay, only a few of you. That's amazing. Put things off. That's why they have a deadline for your taxes. And then they have a second deadline for your taxes. 
He doesn't want to make a decision that's difficult, and so he pushes it off. We know the story, and ultimately he's going to have to make a decision. In fact, he's the only one that will make a decision. But he's going to be sorry he did. But we see what kind of a man he is. He's trying to avoid dealing with it. Now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him because he had heard many things about him. And he hoped to see some miracle done by him. And then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity with each other. It's an interesting thing that they found unity because they were both the enemy of Jesus Christ. Herod, he's this treacherous and lusty ruler credited with the uh, the, the death of John the baptizer and his own wife and two children he had killed because they were a threat to his throne. This isn't the same Herod. This isn't the same Herod that was back when Jesus was born. That was his father. And he had all the children from two and under killed in Nazareth because he wanted to snuff out the king of the Jews who was to be born. You remember the three wise guys show up. They say, We're here to see the king. Where is he? He goes, I I don't know. Let me check with my scribes. And they say, Oh, yeah, we know he's going to be. He's going to be in Bethlehem. So he says, when you, when you see him, let me know and come back because I want to worship him. <laughs> and being warned, they went another way as they went back and he realized he got duped. And he goes and he kills all the children from two and under according to the word that the, the wise men or the magi had told him. That was his father. So you see that the apple doesn't far fall, far fall, from, fall far from the tree. Thank you so much for all your help. So he's this treacherous guy who has no problem killing his own sons and his own wife. If you remember, he also married his brother's wife, Herodias. He had a brother, Philip. He's uh, one of four rulers, and he steals his wife. He divorces his other wife, which makes her dad very unhappy, and it causes a war, and he marries Herodias. John the Baptist gets in his face and says, listen, it's not right that you have your brother's wife. And Herod takes him and realizes he's a man of God, and so he doesn't kill him, but he puts him in prison. And then Herodias has her daughter come out, Salome, and do this sultry dance before him, gets him all hot and bothered, and he says, I'll give you anything you want up to half my kingdom. She said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And so he has John the Baptist assassinated. So that's who this guy is. And he has Jesus come before him and he says, oh, goody, I get to see Jesus finally. I've been so excited to see him do some, I don't know, card trick. Wanted to see a miracle. He's one of these people that's excited about Jesus that he might see something supernatural. And you know, there are people like this still in the world. They don't care anything for Jesus or submitting to his headship, his kingship, his lordship. But they just want Jesus to do something for them. Entertain me. If we're not careful, church can turn into entertainment. And it won't be true worship. It'll just be showing off a bunch of great talents, musical talents, or jumping around talents, or aerobic talents that somebody might have. Herod would be into going to that church. But that's not what Jesus was about. He assumes the name king, but he was not. He was not a king. But he takes on that name and he wants everybody to call him king. He takes after his father who killed all the children two years and younger in an attempt to kill Jesus as a child in the town of Bethlehem. So you get the backstory of this guy. And finally, when Jesus doesn't open up and talk to him and he doesn't perform and do the tricks like a traveling circus is supposed to, he begins to mock him and have him beaten. And they put 
they put a blindfold on him and they begin to beat him and say, oh, yeah, since you're the Christ, you must know who was it who hit you? And so they begin to beat him and mock him. And when they're done, and he says nothing because nothing is what they deserve and nothing is what they would hear. And so they send him back. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, had said to them, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning the things in which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. He made a decision. Yay! For it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. Now, those of you who didn't live in Palestine at that age, probably all of you, don't understand what the thing is. In Passover, what they would do is they would take one prisoner and release it to the Jews. One of the Jewish prisoners, they would release and let them go in an act of kindness and somewhat of a shadow of what happens with the high priest. If you guys are familiar with what a scapegoat is, um, it, it has nothing to do with the Ukraine or Russia. It has to do with Leviticus chapter 16. It says, Aaron shall offer a bull as a sin offering, which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. This is what you do to become purified and ready to do worship on behalf of people. To be a high priest, there has to be a sacrifice, and it's a bull. It's a big one. And he shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord and make atonement upon it, and it shall go as a scapegoat into the wilderness. It's an interesting little practice, and you go, as you read through the Old Testament, you come upon something like this, and you say, that's weird. That's really weird. You take two animals, you draw straws, essentially, to pick one and pick the other. One dies, and the other one you lay hands on, transferring your sins symbolically to that animal, and you let it go. And you put a bell at its neck so nobody thinks, oh, somebody lost their pet. No, no, that's the scapegoat. Don't mess with it. Let it go. It's carrying the sins of the people away. And so the Romans, having sensitivity to the Jews, pick up on this and they say, well, we're going to let one of your people go. And now they have two prisoners. They have Jesus and a man called Barabbas. Perfect setup. I'm sure they had more than just two. And they all cried out at once saying, away with this man and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. I, I don't know if you can think of a worse thing to do than murder. That's, you, you got to be pretty downright mean, right? To actually take another person's life with your bare hands. I think so. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus... Because he, he didn't want any responsibility. Again called out to them. But they shouted saying, crucify him, crucify him. And, they said to, and he said to them a third time, why, what evil has he done? I found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. So he made an announcement a second time. He said three times, there's nothing wrong with this guy. And he said twice, I'm going to punish him. I hope that makes you feel better, and I'm going to let him go. But they're out for blood. John gives us another perspective. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard the saying, he was even more afraid. That's why he doesn't want to make a decision. He's afraid. And so he went again into the praetorium and he said to Jesus, where are you from? 
But Jesus gave him no answer. And then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you, know not, do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? And Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has a greater sin. And from then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. So you see what they did? They basically threatened to tell on him. You can't be a friend of Caesar if you let another king compete. And we're going to tell him. And you know that they would because they've done this before. They got Pilate in trouble twice before, and he's, he, that would be strike three for him. And it was this chant that eventually persuaded him to do what he did because he was going to get in trouble, and he didn't want to get in trouble. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified, and the voices of these men and the chief priests prevailed. And so Pilate gave sentence that it should be as requested. And he released to them the one that they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Matthew gives us a slightly different picture from chapter 27. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And they all said to him, let him be crucified. And the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more saying, let him be crucified. And then Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, rather that a tumult was rising. So he took water and he washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Did you hear what he just called Jesus? Amen. I am innocent of the blood of of this just person. It's not my fault. Was it his fault? Oh yeah. His name goes down in infamy. He's, he's in the Nicene Creed. He's in the Apostles Creed. He, he gets listed everywhere as the one who he suffered under. Pilate goes down in history for this thing. And he says, I'm innocent. It's not my fault. You know, evil men prevail when good men do nothing reminds me of that saying. He says, you see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and our children. Ooh. And then he released Barabbas to them. When he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. He beat him anyway. He was hoping the sight of a fellow Jew being beaten who claims to be the king of the Jews would soften their hearts to the place where they would have some compassion. No, we won't be happy till he's dead. A man who taught, did miracles, spoke against sin, and called himself the Christ, fulfilled prophecies, he's got to die. He even made a plaque. He made a plaque in three different languages so that it could be read. When people were crucified, it was a deterrent against crime, much like the death penalty used to be. And they would take people on crossroads or on high places, and they would crucify them there, and they would put a statement over the top of what they had done so that anybody watching would know, don't do that, because this will happen to you. It's a little like hanging pirates uh, as you're pulling into a cove if you watch the Pirates of the Caribbean. It was a deterrent against crime. And so he made this in three languages and it said, the king of the Jews. He knew exactly what he wrote. And they said, no, you shouldn't write that. You should write that he said he's king of the Jews. He goes, what I wrote, I wrote. It was in the face of all these Jews who were accusing him falsely that he did it. It's interesting. He proclaimed Jesus, the king of the Jews, his enemy, and said, I find no fault in him at all. Herod found nothing wrong with him either. And now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrian, who was coming from the country and on him, they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. 
And a great multitude of the people followed him and women who also mourned and lamented him. The Romans were able to do this. Jesus, because of being whipped and his back opened up, probably ribs being exposed, internal organs now bulging on their way out of the body. He's now carrying the cross member of the cross on his back, tied to his arms. All of the pictures you see of Jesus carrying this 300 pound cross with a big long tail that's the size of a telephone pole. I don't know how many of you, even in good shape, would be able to carry a 300 pound cross. What they would do is they would take the cross member and they would strap it to your arms and that's what you'd carry, which weighs about 125 pounds. Jesus, after the beating, because of his physical limitations, being a human being, and after all the suffering, couldn't take another step. And so the Romans would take out a sword and tap anybody on the shoulder and say, you, come over here. And you had to obey whatever they told you to do. Sometimes they, they would require you to go a mile with them. It was actually the law. They could do that. And Jesus said, if somebody requires you to go one mile, what do you do? You go too. If they strike you on the right cheek, what do you do? If they sue you for your coat, what do you do? You counter sue. <laughs> You're exactly right. And so here's this guy. Now, by the way, he comes from 800 miles away. Cyrene is actually in Africa. It's actually the area of Lib uh, Libya. If, if you know where that is. So here's this Cyrene who comes 800 miles to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And suddenly he sees in the distance the crowd gathering and all of the sound and the noise, and he wants to know what's going on. And so he presses in close and he goes, hey, what's going on? Oh, they're crucifying guys today. Awesome. And suddenly there's a Roman soldier taps him on the shoulder and he turns around and the soldier says, you. Come here. He's like, oh, man, I, I, I'm late to get to the temple. I, I, my, my family's waiting for me. And he puts him underneath the weight with Jesus to carry his cross member. And you know the guy's getting blood all over him. He's thinking, wow, I, I thought I was going to have a pretty good day today. And now he's got to carry this condemned man's cross, bleeding. He visited Jerusalem for the Passover, a pilgrim from 800 miles away from the other side of the Mediterranean Sea in North Africa. So here comes this North African man to carry the cross for Jesus. And he was forced to do so. It's interesting this man's honorable mention in Mark chapter 15, verse 21, it says, and then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, for he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. It's interesting. Mark says, this guy's got two sons and you know them. What's that tell you about Alexander and Rufus? They're believers. I bet they weren't before this event but because of this event. In Romans 16, 13, he brought, uh, he's even given a greeting. Greet Rufus, chosen of the Lord, and his mother and mine, referring to Rufus's mother or Simon's wife. And he says, she's like my mother. It's interesting. There are several Alexanders mentioned in the scripture. It's a very common um, Greek name. But, and they drew Alexander out of the multitude and the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with his hand that he would have made a defense for the people. This is when Paul was in Ephesus and there was a big riot over them preaching. And Alexander steps up and he's trying to get everybody's attention because he wants to speak. This very well might be him. Uh, there are actually three other mentions of Alexander's, but they were not um, good people in good standing. So it's probably not it. So this very well were probably his children who became believers as a result of what he did. Can you imagine being there on that day and being forced to carry the cross member for Jesus? Thinking what a, what a terrible, awful thing this is. And then being that close to Jesus and discovering who he really was. 
that you were carrying the cross for Jesus? Can you think of a greater honor? In Matthew chapter 16, 24 to 27, and Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And, and what does it benefit a person if he gains the whole world, but he forfeits his life? Or what can a person give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. Jesus said, if you want to be my follower, you have to pick up your cross and follow me. Which means you've got to die to yourself, your life, and give it over to the Lord. If you want to have eternal life, you've got to give your life up now. It's like if you want retirement, you've got to make deposits now. If you want eternal life, you've got to die to yourself now. And just so none of you think it's a once and done situation, Luke tells us in chapter 9, verse 23, and he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You see, becoming a Christian is just the beginning. And then we walk with Jesus. We walk with Jesus and are crucified. Amen? Amen. But Jesus turning to them, to the women who were going with him in this travail, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and breasts which never nursed. For they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? Jesus trying to encourage the women as he's going to his death. He's ministering to them and trying to share some thoughts with them as he goes. And that's a rather interesting thing, I think. And he says, there's a day coming when it's going to be miserable for you guys and your children. He's talking about 70 AD when the temple gets torn down and over a million Jews are slaughtered. He says, it's going to be like that. He's also referring, it's interesting when it says, you know, that they crawl into, into caves and they ask the rocks to fall on them. There's, there's an event in the Old Testament where this happens, but there's one other place where this happens too, and it's in the book of Revelation. And I'll pull that up in just a minute. But Jesus says something similar in chapter 21 to the women, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Jesus, before he ever even begins to approach the cross, is saying, those of you who are mourning because you're barren, you should thank God that you don't have that extra burden because you're going to have to run and it's going to be miserable. The compassion that Jesus has on these women and tries to console, because a barren woman would be somebody that was, uh, you know, kind of on the outside because they didn't have children. Children were seen as a blessing from God and so they are. But if you didn't have one, there are lots of reasons why that might be, but it also made people look at you askew. He says, you guys should rejoice because you're the ones who are free because there's going to be a, a tribulation coming like you've never seen. In Revelation chapter 6, we're told this, then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Now, obviously, this is not 70 A.D., this is something in the future that has not yet occurred because we still have a sky. And this says that the stars will fall from the sky and the sun will not give its light any longer. This is the end of all things prophesied here and the, the sixth seal when it's open. And the kings of the earth and great men, rich men and the commanders and the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in caves and in rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. Rather interesting combination of statements. I've never experienced wrath from a lamb because they don't have any real offensive features like a bear might. The wrath of the lamb, speaking of Christ, 
and the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? So here's this near and far prophecy that Jesus gives about those asking the rocks to fall upon them so that they might die. Um, sometimes you get frustrated and you just wish it was all over and it was done. Uh, not like these folks. That's at the end. So Jesus is brought up and we learn some things about Pilate who's reluctant to make a decision. We learn some things about Herod who is a lusty, bloodthirsty person. And he wants to see Jesus perform a trick. And he doesn't, so he beats him and sends him back. And then there's Barabbas. Barabbas, who was a prisoner who was looking at certain death because he murdered. And the, the penalty for that was death. And yet he was released. Can you imagine what went through the mind of Barabbas as he's a murderer and Jesus has just been said three times by Pilate, there is nothing at all wrong with this guy. He figures it's done. <laughs> I'm toast. And then they cut him loose and they let him go and he's free. Do you realize that's your story? That's my story. I stood guilty before God for sin because I was born that way. And I didn't have any power over it. And I was a murderer. And Jesus came and gave himself for me. And I'm the scapegoat. You're the scapegoat. Do you feel like you got away with something? Because you did. We deserve to be punished for eternity for the things that we've done. The things that we imagine in our mind that God sees just like you and I see with our eyes. He sees everything in the imagination of the heart and the mind. And God loved us so much that he sent his only son to die for us so that by believing in him, we might have life in his name. Our testimony is that of Barabbas. None of us is good. There are no good people. No. No. Not one, except for Christ. And it's because of his sacrifice and his death and the willingness that he had to go to the cross that he offers salvation to every person who would believe in him. That's the simple gospel. Anything else is a sales pitch. We are saved by Christ by believing in who he is and what he has done. Simple faith. And that begins the journey of taking up our cross and following Jesus. And he renews us and he gives us a new heart and a new mind. And sin has no longer reign in your mortal bodies. Amen? Amen. That is the good news. I pray if you're within the hearing of my voice and you don't know Jesus, that you might understand this, believe it, and receive a free gift that Jesus has for you today. And you can be forgiven of your sins. You can be made new in the attitude of your mind and your heart. And you can join the family of God. Let's pray as the worship team comes up. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your word and to look at the sacrifice that you made for us by sending your only son. That you yourself came in person in the person of your son. Imprisoned yourself in a physical body and lived a perfect life to be the perfect sacrifice to take what we all have earned and deserve. I pray, Lord, that you would teach us to trust you afresh, that we would take up the cross and follow you, that we would abandon and destroy those things that we know stand against you and against your righteousness, because you have a right to have authority in each one of our lives. Teach us to submit to you and enjoy the peace and the forgiveness and the grace that you offer. Lord, I pray that everyone here would be able to offer their hearts afresh today and that we would pick up that cross, that we might be like, might be like the one who picked up the cross for you, Lord Jesus. Pray that you help us. In Jesus' name, amen.